I will talk here. Yes. So, um, um, so good afternoon. I would like to start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to give this talk here. Um, so as mentioned, I'm, I'm a theorist, uh, but I work with experimentalists in, in the Lodham Shell Laboratory. So, um, okay, let's start the presentation first. And uh, yeah, this is, this is the penguin local of the lab. And let's see if this uh, remote works. Yes. So the Laudentry lab uh, means that uh, the, the physicist can uh, study um, systems at extremely low temperatures, very close to the uh, absolute zero temperature. Here you see a typical uh, sort of refrigerator which uh, is used to uh, cool systems to very low temperatures. Um, so, okay, I guess I, guess I will go here, uh, it's easier. Um, here you see the, let's say, the usual Celsius scale, Kelvin scale. Um, so water freezes at zero Celsius, that's 273.15 uh, in Kelvin. The experiments uh, in the Odenshi lab are usually done at least below the helium uh, liqu liquefaction temperature, which is four Kelvin. But typical uh, non-electronics experiments are carried out at, say, 10 millikelvin above the absolute zero of temperature. Um, here's an example of uh, non-electronics uh, setup that has been studied in, uh, a few years ago. This is a micrograph of, uh, of a sort of system where there are aluminum wires which are connected to each other. And here is like a uh, sort of uh, uh, closer scale picture of this system, it, it was actually used to measure the electron temperature in this system. It's actually not so straightforward, but always to uh, determine the temperature in, in, in at uh, these low temperatures. Why to do, why do study low temperatures usually means that uh, temperature is kind of noise uh, for, for many phenomena. If you lower the temperature, you get reduced noise, and therefore you get all, uh, often sort of new phenomena that you can study. Now, those were the experimental tools which uh, you use. So they, they are fancy tools to create those nanostructures to measure them in, in these systems. Theorist tools are somewhat simpler, uh, so we often use a pencil. I actually bought a uh, sort of a, a special pencil which was at least three euros uh, for myself. Uh, we use notebook and uh, also another not notebook sometimes, but we try to do things just with pencil and paper as well. And we are not philosophers, so we also use dress box and eraser. Um, here's an example from my students' uh, notebook. So, uh, so this is what they look like. Um, OK, but actually, experimentalists can also use this kind of office equipment. Um, I have an example. Here. Um, this is actually this is tape. What people in Manchester uh, some 10 years ago noticed that if you take a piece of tape and you use uh, graphite, basically the same graphite as you have in a, in, in a pencil, well, but, but maybe a bit uh, purer form, you put this tape on, uh, on the graphite and then uh, you take it off. You put it on a silicon substrate and they, you take it off. What is left actually behind is uh, so-called so graphene. Uh, layers. I will tell you in a moment what this graphene is. But uh, this discovery actually earned these people, Andre Geim and Konstantin Novoselov, who did this experiment, the Nobel Prize in physics two years ago. So, and you can see actually that the low temperature is also relevant here. The, there is a uh, gryostat next to uh, Konstantin Novoselov in this picture. Um, so what is graphene? So uh, graphene is actually the only known two-dimensional, uh, sort of truly two-dimensional uh, system in nature. So it consists of uh, carbon atoms which are in sort of a kind of a honeycomb arrangement. Uh, they just make this layer. And uh, graphene can, can be used as sort of, sort of the origin of other kinds of allotropes of uh, carbon. So you have fullerene, carbon nanotubes, and of course the graphite from which it sort of originates. So here is an uh, example picture of... Uh, Microscopy picture of uh, graphene made in uh, in, in the Lodenshire laboratory, and uh, um, where it's actually hanging. So this this part is graphene, and it's hanging on top of the metal sheets. 
here. By the way, the tape that I was showing uh, is used for this so called, it's now called mechanical exfoliation technique, and it's the best technique to make graphene still. Um, okay, so, so the, uh, I will use this graphene as an example as of sort of phenomena which we study. We also study other uh, non electronic systems than graphene, but this is a good example. So, so one thing that you can study uh, in, in here are the vibrations of graphene. So what happens if you uh, now suspend this graphene on top of these metal sheets, and you start to study, the, let's say, it's just the mechanical motion of this graphene. Uh, how people want to study this is that they, uh, they want to measure extremely tiny uh, motion, so they couple it to another element. Now, this is called a superconducting microwave cavity. It's actually also an oscillator. Uh, but here, the, it's not a mechanical oscillator, but it's an uh, oscillator, uh, oscillator of, uh, let's say, electric field and magnetic field. Uh, now, for a theorist, this is how uh, the system looks like. It's just uh, two oscillators which are coupled to each other. And, uh, okay, this is the, the uh, equation that we start from. Um, now, in reality, actually, these experimentalists first did not use graphene for this experiment, but they used a very small aluminum beam, which was connected. Uh, it resides basically here in this cavity. And uh, you, you see, can see that the length of this beam is uh, roughly half of the diameter of the hair. So it's not so small, but these distances uh, are uh, at so this a few nanometers only. Actually, the resolution of this motion sensing in this uh, system is extremely uh, good. You can measure motion uh, uh, to the level of femtometers, which is roughly the size of a proton. So this is, uh, this is why you use this superconducting cavity. So, okay, what people found out actually was that if you send now microwave light to this cavity, uh, due to this mechanical motion, it gets amplified. So you can make an amplifier out of this. And, okay, so there, there is the experiment and the theory and that they are on top of each other. Uh, but, okay, um, why is this uh, sort of interesting? So besides the application as an amplifier, it's uh, sort of that this amplifier is uh, uh, quite good. And I try to tell you in which way it is good. So... Um, so now, you know the, uh, let's say, you take an old radio, and this radio receives uh, electromagnetic signal, which it then converts to sound at some point, and there is typically some amplification. You need a battery to run this radio. So, uh, so this tries to amplify the signal to some, some extent. But any amplifier adds noise uh, to the signal. And, and you know that if you have an old radio, it adds, adds sort of more noise than maybe some newer radio, uh, so you can sort of improve this system. But then you can think, what is the smallest amount of noise that an amplifier uh, can add uh, to a signal? And it turns out that, uh, okay, so, so one, you can, there are many noise sources related with imperfections in the setup and so on, but those in principle you can uh, get rid of by good engineering. Uh, but then you still have thermal noise, uh, which, which you usually always have uh, in your system. But this, I mean, especially if you are in the low tension laboratory, you can uh, reduce this thermal noise uh, or even get rid of it by refrigerating the same system. But on top of this, you have so-called quantum zero-point motion. And this you cannot get rid of. And uh, in fact, it turned out that our amplifier was very close to this limit of quantum limit where you only had this uh, zero-point motion. And uh, this was one of the reasons why it was... Uh, accepted to a nice uh, journal last year. Okay, this is an artist's uh, image of this setup where you have a vibrating wire, incoming light, outgoing light, and uh, um, yeah, so, and the outgoing light is amplified. Uh, I apparently have only a couple of minutes left, so I only sort of uh, uh, flash a couple of other topics we have studied. So one, one topic is uh, what happens if you take this graphene layer and you start to stack them on top of each other. So, of course, you get graphite. But you can actually do different kinds of stackings uh, of these layers. So, uh, and what we found out that actually a certain kind of stacking supports a very high temperature superconducting state. So we sort of suggested that there is a possibility to uh, observe uh, superconductivity at very high temperature in these systems. And actually, something like this has been done. Whether it's related to our mechanism or not, it's not yet clear. Actually, this summer, uh, people uh, uh, reported observation of superconductivity in graphite layers uh, at least to, at temperatures of the order of 150 Kelvin, so that's minus 120 Kel uh, Celsius, 
But the same group actually very recently this, this month basically uh, reported the observation of room temperature superconductivity in the system. But this is just an indication. It's not yet totally clear whether it was superconductivity or not. Okay, so uh, there is one more topic, but I guess uh, I will, won't have too much time on this. You can use uh, graphene, for example, for uh, radiation detection, and uh, you can create uh, nice pictures. This is not done with a graphene radiation detection, but, but with a superconducting sensor uh, in, in VDT Miller lab. So you can measure the thermal no, uh, sort of uh, noise coming from uh, the person. So without illuminating the person, you can see the, just the temperature that this, uh, this guy is uh, emitting. Uh, okay, so uh, this, is, this is kind of a sample of uh, the topics which we are doing uh, in, in the Lodonger lab. And uh, the idea always is to study the generic phenomenon, but sometimes these generic phenomena can be used for applications. Thank you for your attention.